everyone and welcome to Cassandra Lunch number 84. Today we have our CEO here at Anant, Raul Singh, and he's going to be presenting on data platform design around Cassandra. And this is including Spark, uh, Cassandra, Spark, and Kafka. Everyone and welcome to the, the oh sorry you guys, I gotta mute this. Um, the co-organizers and organizers for this event are Raul Singh, Arpin, and myself. And we are always looking for additional speakers, members, and sponsors. So if you or someone you know would like to speak at this event or um, tell your friends about this event, and then of course sponsoring this event, please reach out to Arpin or myself. Our emails are listed there at the bottom of that slide. And we are a part of a larger community. Data Community DC is a diverse and inclusive culture. And together we support, um, People of all races, gender, sexual orientations, everyone's welcome here and we expect respect to be given to those classes. You can find out more about Data Community DC at their blog, along with their upcoming events. Those links are listed there at the bottom. And what we cover here is everything related to Cassandra. So this includes the surrounding ecosystem, um, Spark, Kafka, as we're gonna discuss a bit today, data stacks, Scylla, um, so all things Cassandra. And if anyone is new and would like to introduce themselves and uh, talk about what they do with Cassandra, feel free to do so and I can pause. Otherwise, I'm going to continue with the group rules. If you have a question, please ask it. Uh, be polite and courteous to others and share what you know. This is meant to be a discussion. Here to not, we deal with real-time data and analytics platforms on a daily basis. And Cassandra is our go-to database, if you will. So something we're very passionate about and like to discuss and are happy to bring these uh, avenues of learning to through this discussion. DataStax is also a partner along with George Washington University and some of the other program and organiza organizational sponsors are listed here. And if anyone has any announcements, um, drop it in the chat or let us know and we can pause. Um, one announcement we have is Anant is hiring for full or part-time positions at data platform operator, engineer, or architect. You can connect with us at careers.anant.us. And I do have one other announcement that Cassandra Lunch is moving to Thursdays. It'll still take place at the same time, same place as in the same Zoom link. Um, so be sure to adjust your calendars accordingly. We'll still be doing weekly webinars surrounding Cassandra. It will just be on Thursdays now instead of Wednesdays. Um, some upcoming Cassandra and Data Engineers lunches. Um, the next Data Engineers Lunch, we'll be talking about Spring Cloud Data Flow with Cassandra. And the, the first Thursday edition of Cassandra Lunch will be talking about the top 10 open source projects using Cassandra in 2022. You can find all of our events listed at not.us slash events. All of these videos are recorded and uploaded to YouTube. So if you wanna go back and find out, we've discussed a lot of what, 85 different topics, I guess starting at 10, so 75 different topics surrounding Cassandra. So if you wanna catch up, be sure to check out that playlist. And Cassandra Link should be your number one resource for Cassandra. Um, if you ever have a question, these are hand curated articles by Raul Singh or those of us here at Anant. Um, so be sure to make that your number one spot to find any information regarding Cassandra. And with that, I will pass it off to Raul. Hey, thank you, uh, Josh. Appreciate it. Um, wow, number eighty-five. Uh, we're getting up to number number hundred. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, quite a, a collection of of, of, of videos, and uh, I know that each of these videos has blog posts. And so, I was talking to uh, Peter Corliss from Scylla, and we were talking about how the Cassandra lunch topics, you know, one after another, are um, it's, it's like a course in itself, you know, uh, to learn things about Cassandra that you wouldn't necessarily find elsewhere. So uh, kudos to everybody who's been involved with that. Um, I have actually downloaded my, my deck into a PDF because I'm skeptical that uh, <laughs> Google uh, presentations is gonna uh, survive uh, in, in terms of like, it's just been flaky for me today. So um, give me one second, I'm just gonna pull up the PDF. Uh, let me know when you can see. I'm gonna just share the window and that should be enough. 
All right, we can see it. Great. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, thanks again for starting us off, Josh. Um, you know, today's topic, designing, you know, global pl data platforms with Cassandra, um, really to, to expand that, um, what I would say today's topic is data and analytics platforms that involve Cassandra, Spark, and Kafka because they go so well together. Um, and that today's topic is about how do we architect and, and manage a, a global data and analytics platform on cloud neutral systems with commercially supported open source components. Um, because ultimately there's, a, there, and you'll see in, in the presentation that there are so many different ways to slice this cat in terms of how to deal with data. Uh, my experience and just seeing it with different companies that uh, I've worked with uh, through our company and even before is that no one size fits all, but there are certain patterns that over the last 10 years, um, I've seen at the largest organizations or the ones that have survived from a growth growth perspective, and meaning that they're, you know, they're they're relatively new companies, um, but they they keep surviving and they keep scaling. And those common patterns are what we're going to talk about today. What I would like to get across to you today is, you know, what um, what is a business platform in terms of you know why do companies need a business platform? Um, what does data have to do with it uh, in terms of, you know, building such a, a global, like a global platform? Why does a global business platform need a global data platform? Uh, <laughs> um, why hasn't this been, this been an issue before? Um, then we'll get into why Cassandra, Spark, and Kafka could be useful in achieving that goal. And, and then finally, a bit of our company's approach and um, our framework and how we you know, bring these things together. Uh, Kubernetes is a big part of what we do nowadays, but I'm not gonna talk about it because that's a whole different uh, ball game um, because today's topic is to focus on the global, uh, the, the data and analytics platforms. And these are, as far as I can see right now, best uh, scaled on just, you know, as they are without being wrapped in Kubernetes. Um, which, uh, which continues to be improved, but we're not going to discuss that today. At our company, we uh, help our clients build their global data platforms on scalable uh, uh, platforms, such as um, Cassandra, Spark, and Kafka, with our playbook, framework, and, and knowledge base. We've helped lots of companies over the last 10, 12 years. Um, many of these you recognize, some of them we've done data work, some of them we've done CX, but at, at the core of what we do, it's about building a business platform for our clients. And what business platforms are to us, well, it's making something that is a digital technology business platform so that our clients can do great things. Um, in day and age of the internet, where everybody expects a mobile experience, a website experience, um, notifications on their watch, notifications on their devices at home, like Echo or Google. Um, they need something great <laughs> to give people a great customer experience. And that involves uh, a little bit of platform thinking. Uh, platform thinking is about how to build things that allow people, process information systems to work together through um, not necessarily pipelines, but um, pipelines are involved, but rather interconnectedness and interdependent processes. Um, and the best platforms are those that allow people to self-service and get what they need, um, whether it's a two-way marketplace or uh, whether it's just client, uh, you know, business to consumer or business to business, allowing the customer to interact with the staff of the company uh, without necessarily having too many um, process controls stopping them. Beyond that, uh, we like to get, or at least uh, have our clients understand um, enterprise consciousness. And for us, that means people process information systems connected and in sync. 
And that's a very tall order, especially as a company starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, this graphic is from a Gartner report from 2016, um, talking about digital business technology platforms. And this particular graphic shows how uh, customers, partners, employees, and things talk to each other in five areas of business platforms, uh, one being customer experience, another one being uh, partner ecosystem platforms, employees using information systems, and things uh, being coordinated with IoT systems. And then finally, at the, in the middle of all this, to connect all these things together, it's data and analytics platforms. And that's where we, that's where we work as a company, and that's where our expertise is. What is enterprise consciousness? Uh, if you have heard about the 12 factor app, you can Google the 12 factor manifesto. The 12 factor app is about you know, reactive, uh, uh, you know, scalable, message driven, uh, easy to maintain, um, basically an application that is elastic or our company uh, could even be elastic. Um, 12 factor is about an application. We look at 12 factor and applying it to the whole company and thinking, how can that organization expand and scale and be elastic. Uh, deeper uh, than that, it's can current business information be available to the user or the customer in, in the, the quickest way possible, right? Within the bounds of, of the reasonable cost. Um, is business information available generally to the enterprise uh, and only secured because of security and governance reasons? Uh, do the data platforms make use of appropriate resources for hot, cold, raw versus enhanced data, meaning appropriately storing and retrieving data, uh, A, uh, you know, because not all data is created equal and not all data needs to be immediately available. How do they properly manage data? Um, it's just like your brain, you know, you don't, you have short-term, you have long-term memory. How does, an how does an enterprise manage that? And uh, this one in particular is more so informed from our experience uh, which is to make data platforms that are always redundant, available, and always trying to achieve a RPO or, and an RTO of zero. RPO stands for recovery point objective. RTO stands for recovery time objective. And that basically means if your system goes down, to which point can you go back? Right? Is your recovery point an hour before it went down? And recovery time is how long does it take to come back up? So how do we achieve a recovery point objective and a recovery time objective of zero. Well, it's the tools that we use. It's, it's the technologies we use that we can uh, achieve that. Data platform operations inside the business uh, a platform. Uh, also, you can you know, think about it as data and analytics platform operations involves a lot of moving pieces. And there's no one tool or technology that's gonna make this easy. Um, there's lots of sources of data. Uh, there are a lot of uh, consumers of data outside. Um, there are different ways to get data in. There are different ways to get data out. There are different ways to store information. There are different ways to process information into the, the, the core uh, data. And then there's different ways to analyze it. So when somebody thinks about a global platform, no one tool these days can support that. Back um, 20, 10, 20, maybe it's a 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, you would choose a particular vendor and say, well, we're going to use Microsoft and we're going to use everything that's Microsoft or we're going to use Oracle and we're going to use everything that's Oracle. And then e-commerce happened. Then, uh, you know, uh, companies that were serving millions of users uh, in one way or another simultaneously happened. And those technologies didn't, cut it. Um, so the big data world came out and simul I would say a, a parallel to that, the cloud world came out. So today what you see is a convergence of big data technologies in conjunction with those uh, more legacy uh, technologies I was mentioning earlier and cloud technology. And that journey for an organization is uh, basically you know, four-step process. And there's a really good book called Enterprise Architecture and Strategy, uh, Creating a Foundation uh, for Business Execution, uh, published in 2006. I think that's around when I, when I read it, changed my career and definitely is a big core 
part of what we do uh, at our company is helping helping companies understand and see this. Um, the you know uh, the first thing that a business has is basically a silo uh, or several silos of data, and it works for each group that's using it. The next thing a, a business tends to have to do at some point to scale is is standardize it. So we're just going to use Windows. We're just going to use Microsoft, uh, you know, .NET, or we're just going to use Docker. I'm just giving different examples. Or we're going to use Apple only, and you know, and Macs only, and, and you know, uh, we're going to write everything in Objective C. Like who does that except for Apple? Um, then there's the ability at that point to start to create an optimized for. You have standardized enterprise processes, standardized data systems, um, and most of the time when we're involved with our clients, we're basically helping them go from standardized technology to an optimized core. If they can create this optimized core, then they're really able to get to the next level of, of you know, business efficiency, which is business modularity with standard interfaces and, and business componentization such that when they acquire a company or they wanna create a new service, the technology enables them and empowers them to do it rather than inhibits their growth. Um, but at least what the book says and what I've seen and what other people have seen is that it is extremely hard to get to this business modularity overnight. Um, even if at the very beginning you have that in mind, uh, especially today with everything available, you know, software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, all of that stuff being done for you, um, those are all silos, right? So even if you start with a completely modern stack, and if you even if you just go use AWS for everything as your standardized um, platform and you choose to use their data offerings to do everything, even then there's this kind of acknowledgement of business silos. How is it going to get standardized? How is it going to get optimized? How is it going to be modular? Well, whether it's legacy technologies or modern technologies, in this case, you can see a bunch of icons that are all as a service. Um, way we see is that it's it's a um, it's a curation process of you know creating a framework, cur curating a framework uh, of systems so that there's not a lot of random apps and systems that come in, uh, using the right people. Um, and then connecting it all together. And, and eventually all of that has to uh, impact users. And what do users do? You'll, users generally find information, they, they analyze it if it's data or if it's like a you know, graph. And eventually um, after they find and analyze it, they're acting on that knowledge. And then going forward, they're communicating with that knowledge. And these are just broad, uh, you know, kind of cliches of what people do with information, but you know, ultimately these tools, these information systems or customer experience systems are to facilitate the movement of information between people and things. We have a playbook that we've been using uh, for a while and it consists of some design principles which have uh, a recommended framework and a recommended approach and we're gonna look at that later. Um, but this is a slightly older version of our curated framework of different tools that we like using or have used uh, that work well together or can be quickly connected together. Um, as technology has progressed, now there's more no-code, low-code integration platforms. It's not as important these days that it has to work out of the box immediately. What is important is that they have standardized interfaces. So does the system offer REST or GraphQL? Um, is it on Integra Mat or is it here, right? These are the type of questions we can ask these days. And so this uh, graph of components, and in this case, we're looking at customer experience, data analytics, and information systems, just those three, it can be much larger. Finally, the goal of doing all of this work and connecting it together is that there's a streamlined, organized, and unified business platform that is collecting, transforming, archiving, processing, serving uh, data, and, and allowing applications to use that information that is not readily available in the data, uh, the core databases of the source systems, right? If all of these apps on the left-hand side here, right? If all of these apps 
magically were together and had all the data present in the way that you know people want them, then there will be no need for all of this. But there's a transition happening now, which is that there is a uh, movement uh, as companies mature and as they need to scale and as their customers want real-time experiences, there's a movement to do this in real time, meaning not immediately, that's impossible, uh, except through quantum computing, which we don't have yet, um, or quantum databases, which we don't have yet. Um, there's a movement towards near real time. And there's a little bit of friction between the old guard and the new guard, which is, do we need real time? Do we need batch-based systems? And the reality is, I think we need both. Um, but it's good to understand why we need real time and why we need batch before we just, you know, become religious about one thing or the other. A lot of the current tools have issues. Um, I've heard it so many times. Redis, RabbitMQ, Mongo, not scaling. Uh, our C-sharp monolithic application isn't performing. So we put it into Docker and it's kind of doing it on Kubernetes, but it's not really doing it. Can't really do big data. Uh, data replication, resiliency between systems is difficult in these systems because A, they have to work and then they have to export the data. And so, and then all of that has to be managed. So, you know, what, you know, DevOps, da data ops, are these things even in place, right? These are just issues we've seen. And the goals we recommend are, well, first of all, making sure that data is, is you know, scalable and resilient in terms of message delivery, fault tolerant data processing, real-time storage of data and retrieval, uh, automatic deployment and upgrades, predictable, scalable growth for the platform, and then customer satisfaction. Um, you know, and, and, and for data quality and freshness is one thing that maybe the customer doesn't really say, but when somebody has ordered something on their app, right, for food pickup, and they show up at the restaurant, right, the data quality and freshness is important because the restaurant should, A, have, you know, updated their system, the customer should know, hey, their food is ready for pickup, right, that's, that's a, example of a business platform, many DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber Eats, all of these have some sort of interface that connects the restaurants with the, with the consumer or even the delivery people, right? The delivery people have to know, be notified when the food is ready. Um, all that is really about data quality and freshness. The old guard in data and analytics has been about ETL, batch, uh, batch processing and, and waiting. Uh, sometimes waiting on a SQL server process to run for 24 hours to run a SQL query. It'll work. It'll just take a long time. Um, and basically assuming that things are synchronous, every process, every business process is synchronous and you have to wait until one is done to go to the next one. Uh, everything must be done sequentially. There may be some parallel processing, but at the end of the day, everything has this kind of start and stop and beginning, middle, and end, and there's a cycle that it goes through. The new guard is about events happening everywhere and data being current as much as possible everywhere. Um, that the state of the systems is this dynamic, where the state of the enterprise is dynamic, and it's dynamically asynchronous, meaning that there's no state but everything is, is kind of, a, can be represented in a stream of events, things that are happening. And these two things are not mutually exclusive. One of them allows companies to do really heavy tasks in the fastest way possible that requires analyzing a lot of data. The other is about looking at information, processing it as it comes in, as it changes and giving it to the people that need it as soon as possible. The new guard also has, um, uses more of streams, queues, and buses. And by the way, you know, I can remember almost 22 years ago, um, the concept of like an enterprise service bus, 
being used at companies. Um, specifically, I was going to work for a company back then. It was called UUNet. Um, you can Google what UUNet was, and they were in the middle of implementing an enterprise service bus. And I, I was asking uh, my brother, who was who kind of got me this like job, right? Basically, like the summer after high school. Um, and I said, "Why do we need that?" He's like, "Well, because with a with an enterprise service bus built built on a queue, you can send a message and have a hundred different systems take that message and do something with it. And as you keep adding data." You can keep adding more and more subscribers and they can do something with that information. Otherwise, how else are they going to communicate? And it was like, well, put in a database and let's have all of them talk to the database. And back then, databases uh, could only do so many transactions uh, you know, per second and you would just have to have bigger and bigger databases, but eventually they would hit a limit. So queues and queue processing allowed systems to scale even when the core technologies at the time didn't. Well, these days, queues, streams, uh, you know, buses, they still help. And in fact, what's different is that there's just more of it. There's just more things happening. Um, what would be seemingly unimportant 20 years ago is very important now. Did you pick up your phone and look at the notification that was sent to you by Starbucks? That's an event that then informs Starbucks that, hey, this person, when notified of, um, you know, buy three things over the next three days, you get 100 points, this person will look at it. That's me, by the way. I love getting my Starbucks points. Um, and then they give me more of those promotions. In fact, they'll give it to me, you know, if I, if I come into some radius of a Starbucks, right? Because they, they know. And, and unfortunately for me, there's like three Starbucks in, in my neighborhood. So they're always kind of aware of what I'm doing. <laughs> That's through, some of that is because of, of, of messaging technology that is so scalable that millions of customers are getting the same experience at the same time. And behind that, there are many, 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 many technologies uh, when brought together um, that allow companies to do that, to achieve that this combination of real-time processing and, and batch processing. Being able to do both is, is ideal. We've covered uh, some of these icons here on this uh, meetup. Um, there are a few that we will probably cover later. But every single one of the icons here uh, represent some distributed technology that allows people to scale infinitely, or that's the promise. I think almost everybody here knows what Cassandra is, but for the sake of the recording, if somebody's watching this and they don't, they don't know what Cassandra is, um, we're gonna cover Cassandra in three slides. That's kind of impossible, but I'll do my best. Cassandra is an open source uh, database that scales massively around the world. Um, it's not for people to be cool, right? It's not for people that just you know, want, want uh, to store gigabytes of data. It's for massive companies like Netflix, Apple, Walmart, Starbucks, um, and not just Cassandra, right? Like there was a world not only uh, not only SQL became NoSQL, so not only Cassandra, but it could be Cassandra variants uh, like Datastax, like Astra, um, Cognos DB, uh, Cosmos DB, not Cognos, Cosmos DB, uh, AWS uh, uh, managed key spaces for Cassandra. They all have this similar promise that the, you know you can scale this globally. Some of them are based on core Cassandra code, and some of them are proprietary. ScyllaDB is written in C++. Yugabyte is written in C++. Uh, but they love the concepts that come from Cassandra. And these concepts actually come from a combination of the big table paper from Google and the DynamoDB paper from Amazon. And this is an open source technology. And then there's commercially available technologies that allow you to do this. 
And unless you are Facebook or Amazon or Google, and you need a massively scalable database, this is probably the best option if you want to be cloud neutral. That means that you don't necessarily want to be tied down by one cloud vendor. The reason Cassandra scales so well is that it, at the core, it's a key value store, just like a lot of the you know, um, non-relational databases, not only SQL databases. Um, because updates come in and they're stored in a certain way and they're simultaneously Simultaneously available because it's also stored in memory. Um, but the other really uh, kind of useful benefit of Cassandra is that it's not only SQL, but it doesn't require you to use just you know JSON or or uh, you can use JSON to date, put data in and get it out. But because there's a really familiar SQL-like language now, now, other systems now have SQL-like languages, but you know, it, this scales pretty well, right? It can scale to hundreds of thousands of servers. And uh, what I was getting at is the reason why it's so fast is that there's a set of technologies that allow it to distribute the data around the cluster without needing any load balancers and storing it in the right places in several, uh, several places. So if one server goes down, that data is available. But also from the retrieval side, it's, it's, it's engineered for extremely fast writes, but it's also engineered to be able to get the data in a fairly uh, you know, quick um, speed. And because it replicates data, not only to replicas in, in each data center, it can, it can, and it does, replicate whole data sets, whole databases, we call them key spaces in Cassandra. It replicates them in different data centers. So if you want a data center in Europe, um, uh, Western Europe, North Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, Australia, you know, North America, South America, and have that data available to everybody, um, it can do that and can keep it consistent. So this technology allows companies to have a structured data fabric that is extremely fast and globally available and always uh, redundant, never goes down. That's very powerful. And it's open source so that they can use on-premise hardware, they can use their own, basically their own private cloud, they can use a public cloud, they can have a hybrid setup, they can store this data in containers or VMs or, or, or bare metal, it doesn't matter. Cassandra as a protocol allows this to happen uh, seamlessly across different, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter where it's installed, Cassandra will replicate the data. So now we have a, an enterprise data fabric where data can always be spread around and eventually be consistent. Spark uh, is a cool technology that allows us to, to process. Uh, and processing is, is a very, uh, uh, you know, it, it's really short, shortcutting what its ability is. Spark is a general purpose distributed computing engine and it allows us to do many things. Uh, it distributes data. Uh, so in order for it to do something, it has to retrieve the data. It distributes it in a cluster and it can process it, and then it can send it back to wherever it needs to go. It connects with a lot of different things. It can work on a lot of different um, uh, you know, environments. Um, so like Cassandra, it's open source and there are some commercial vendors, but it can work on different clouds. It can also work on different schedulers. So there's Mesos, there's Kubernetes, there's, um, there's commercial uh, variants of Spark available like Databricks, Elastic MapReduce, um, Google Data Proc, uh, Azure, HD Insight is kind of a Hadoop, their version of Hadoop, they also have Spark. So Spark is available just like Cassandra can be anywhere, Spark can be anywhere. And it's used to run many different applications, not just custom code. There's software that runs on top of Spark because it just works. Um, you know, some examples, you know, Presto has a Spark runner. Denodo is a data virtualization tool. It, it has a Spark runner. So Spark is kind of a standard now. It's very fast uh, because it works with basically in memory and with CPUs. Um, it can do, depending on how big your cluster is, it can do terabytes data. 
And uh, since it allows people to use different programming languages, it actually, um, you know, can, can be used by data scientists, data engineers. Uh, there's a Spark SQL, which can be used with BI tools to for data analysts. So it's, it's an all purpose distributed engine, but it can do a lot of things. So we will cover amazing things about Spark later, but it's, it's, it's distributed, it's fast. Um, it's amazing. It can do machine learning. And then Kafka uh, is a distributed messaging, or it's actually a distributed log to put data in the log and then that log can be retrieved by different people. So people use Kafka for, for PubSub type applications or they use it for, um, you know, uh, just data storage in general and to be able to look at it in a structured way uh, later on. So Kafka is not just a broker that sends data and, and that you send data to and that can be retrieved by, uh, by the consumers, right? It's not just that. Kafka has a lot of other stuff around it. There are different tools and technologies that are now Kafka compliant. So Cassandra has a lot of Cassandra compliant databases. Kafka has the same. Spark, on the other hand, is just Spark. Nobody's come up with a better Spark. It's basically Spark. Um, there's variants in that people support it. So Databricks, Datastax has a Spark also. And the core Spark. Um, so Kafka, the system is actually a combination of the core distributed commit log, the, the broker engine that you put data in and you can retrieve it. The Kafka Connect ecosystem is amazing. It's all these connectors to put data in and get data out without having to program. You just kind of have a declarative syntax to say, this is my source and this is my sync. And then Kafka Connect actually automatically gets data, puts it into Kafka core, um, the, 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 the broker. And it has another thing that then gets the data out of the, uh, the Kafka core and that can send it to wherever it needs to go. Kind of like an enterprise service, but not, but not exactly. There's Kafka streams, which are like serverless functions kind of, but basically they, uh, they work on one message at a time. They can also uh, work with concepts like uh, what's called a K-table or K-stream, uh, which basically allows you to create dynamic real-time tables backed by data that's coming in in real time. And so, and then finally built on all, all this stuff is this uh, thing called Kafka SQL, where you can do queries on structured, um, you know, as, as data comes into structured topics, uh, in the broker, you can do queries on it in real time. It's not necessarily to serve up millions of users, but from a from a you know querying perspective, analysis perspective, it's pretty cool. How do people use it? Um, they use it to connect everything together. Um, in terms of you know having one place where all the data lands, so that it can be processed in different ways. Um, take all the data from all the systems, put it into Kafka, have all of it saved to Cassandra, have some of it processed and saved to Postgres for business you know, intelligence users that wanna do a slice and dice, um, have some of it processed and sent out as notifications to people via Apple push notifications. Um, <clears throat> it's an event log um, that, again, it's if you have a large organization, you wanna, you want to save everything that happened in a business. Um, you can do that with Kafka. Every single data change, uh, because it's it can scale and it can put old data into older, um, you know, colder storage, and you can keep newer data uh, uh, available to you. Um, mind you that Kafka's scale is in taking information and making it available to many many consumers in a sequenced manner. It's um, and it's kind of like a database in that sense that you can always say, give me the data from 10 days ago, right? Um, but Kafka, because it can do that, people do use it kind of like a database. But it's, it basically stores whatever you sent it. And you can say, delete data after like, you know, 10 days or something like that. Uh, you can use it as a pipeline. You have different topics and different processors that take data from one topic process it, send it into another topic. And as I mentioned earlier, it can just be a bridge. 
to connect a lot of different things. Lots of cool stuff in, in the Kafka world. So when we put all this together, we get architectures that look like this. Kafka is being used to get data in. Then there's another Kafka uh, connector. Oh, sorry, then, then there's Kafka connector that can take that data from, from that and put it directly into Spark. And then Spark can take that data and put it into Cassandra. And then Cassandra makes that data available to everybody. Lambda architecture is about balancing stream and batch processing, right? Coming back to what, what could be useful, real-time processing, batch processing, what do we use? Um, you can use the stream for making sure people get a real-time customer experience or real-time information system updates. At the same time, because the data is landing in a scalable system like Cassandra, um, you, can, you can do machine learning learning, update the data, send notification through Kafka so that users get the updated data, machine trained or machine evaluated data. Master data management. If there's a lot of different places where a customer exists in terms of data, then updates to that can get reconciled and put into one place. Again, these are just some examples of different use cases. In this case, what you see is Kafka Connect, taking data from all these things and sending data to other systems. And so this would not necessarily provide, uh, this would not necessarily need programming because you declaratively say, take this data as a source and send it here. Now, while this is happening, Spark can process that information and do something with it and send it back to the topics. Pretty powerful. So how do we do it at Anant? We have a, a framework. I would say it's an opinionated framework. It's, it's something that we've used in general. Um, in, in, you know, and sometimes we use the whole thing. Sometimes we use parts of it. That's why it's a framework. And the way we created the framework is by evaluating different categories of technologies as objectively as possible. Um, and, and giving it kind of like uh, an analog in the computer world. So persistent queue is like the RAM or the bus. Queue processing and compute uh, is like the CPU. Uh, persistent storage is like disk or RAM. The reporting engine is kind of like a display and that's not represented in this uh, matrix here. Uh, the orchestration framework uh, is like the motherboard. Uh, and in fact, I would say some parts of the, uh, you know, Q processing could also be seen as a motherboard. And then finally, the scheduler, how do we run all this stuff is, is the operating system. There are several strategies, right? Open source, you can do cloud native, um, you can do commercial source or pure commercial. And what this basically shows is that there are different ways to do streams and queues. There are different ways to do processors in open source. Doesn't mean that what I'm trying to say is that not all of these things are right or wrong for everybody. It's it just depends on what 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 the company needs. Um, and the reason you we 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 have to be flexible with organizations is that they may be on Google and they may be using some of these things and they're not working. So what we can do is we can suggest some open source component, or we can support we can uh, recommend some commercial source component to enhance what they already have in their, in their cloud. Or if they're completely on-premise, they can use open source or commercial source. Visually, it's about layers that support higher layers. So there's infrastructure, uh, which needs to be orchestrated and prepared in order to run data infrastructure and processing infrastructure and queuing infrastructure um, to, to also uh, maybe uh, operate querying uh, ELT or ETL uh, infrastructure. And then that allows people to use third-party tools for BI, commercial or open source, third-party tools to get access to this information. Um, and then, 
of course, each organization will have their own user interfaces and their own custom engine to do what they need with their information. The fact is that so many tools are available that do what they do really, really well. Most companies don't need to reinvent the wheel. They can just either acquire an open source or a commercial product. Um, but their challenges are basically in bringing it all together. How, does these, how do these things fit together? And another way that we uh, solve this is, uh, of course, we have our framework, but then we also have an approach that once we are building it and it's built and it's working, how do we manage it? Because components in a system like this, you can imagine there's so many different components. How do we manage it in a scalable way? And that's through our stack approach, which is a kind of a miniaturized, you know, enterprise framework to just really focus on some of the things that we need to operate the DevOps and the data ops for, uh, for the whole platform and just documenting the core needs of the setup, the training, the administration, the customization, and then having knowledge management around all of that. In big organizations and small organizations, knowledge is what empowers the team to grow because as people come, they can learn the best practices, or they can learn how to set up something. Uh, it also empowers, uh, especially today, uh, because teams are remote, remote companies to scale in a distributed way. That's my talk for today. Um, and uh, before we go to q and I'll just say that, uh, you know, we provide three things to our, our audience. We have free knowledge available on you know, playbook.us, blog.us. We have obviously Cassandra.link and Cassandra.tools, which was which were mentioned earlier. We offer training. Um, if you're interested in, in, in uh, learning some of this or all of it, we can structure a training for you or your team around data engineering, DevOps, and data ops. And uh, if you can't afford it, you want to learn it, we can provide an apprenticeship program. Uh, and then finally, for our clients, we, we have a service catalog around these tools. Um, some, some of the key ones that we use more frequently than others are Cassandra, Spark, Kafka, and Airflow. And uh, there's a, obviously a lot more uh, that goes on um, under that, like DevOps and DataOps. So we have some set, set of tools such as Terraform and Ansible that we love using. That's it, Josh. And we'll open it up to a few questions before we wrap up today. All right, thank you, Raul. Solid timing on the uh, presentation as well. Um, I had just one question, and this might be a full discussion in and of itself, but uh, what was your process for kind of choosing this stack? Um, was it a product of just what works well with Cassandra, or um, was there something that led you to each of these individual technologies that you really liked? <clears throat> um, yeah, um, actually, that's a really good question. Um, so, you know, actually, over time, I saw that large organizations needed distrib distributed components, things that are not limited to one computer and not limited to n computers, right? They can continue growing. Um, they needed real-time uh, systems. Um, real-time meaning that there wasn't necessarily a delay uh, between data coming in and data being available. Um, they needed to be extendable or open um, in that open systems like Cassandra or Spark um, allow us to choose where to put it. So big companies that need to be always up and running, for example, they could just choose to use Amazon. But what if Amazon goes down? And there are some companies that have multi-cloud strategies because they need to have multi-cloud strategies. or they want to save money and then uh, basically have their analytical processing on premise because um, it's expensive like to run hundreds of servers to do spark processing. It's expensive right, uh, to do it on the cloud. So they could offset their, their costs. So it, it just needed to be you know, open source for, for that particular reason. But there's also commercially backed open source that allows people to do the same thing. Uh, but ultimately, extendability is about not just being open. It's also being about generally uh, adaptable. Um, there also needed to be 
a way to kind of like automate the the setup and the configuration of this. Uh, and so Cassandra allows us not by itself, but making it simple to configure it. Spark after you know uh, a certain set of settings, it's you just keep adding more and more servers and it'll continue growing, right? So there's a way to scale up and scale down, um, which in other technologies, it's hard to, to scale up and scale down MongoDB in a multi-region, multi, you know, in a global environment. Uh, I think Mongo, uh, Mongo's commercial cloud offering, Atlas is probably the only thing that can do that. Um, but, you know, it's it's hard. So if, if it's easier to automate, that's when I was starting to look at it that as in that lens as well. And of course, can it be openly monitored? Can I get everything you know inside it? And that's actually the, you know, the the principles. If you go to playbook.anat.us, that's those are the five principles of like evaluating it: distributed, real time, extendable, automated, and 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 monitorable or are you know measurable in terms of we can we see what's going on because as systems grow, just like a business has business intelligence, these distributed systems have so many metrics that need to be analyzed to see if, if something needs to be changed. Anything else? Anybody else? Thank you. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you, Josh. Uh, I apologize for repeated failures to show up, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll figure that out, how to be more available next time. Hey, we've made it work. Um, and yeah, just a reminder, we are moving Cassandra lunch to Thursdays instead of Wednesdays. Um, partially availability, partially also to uh, work better with our partner in data stack. So um, be sure to adjust your calendars accordingly. Thank you everyone for showing up. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe.